Well, first of all, I, I, I want to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity to su summarize this conference, which is going to be difficult to do in a very short period of time, but I will try. Uh, but first, I have to an admission I, I want to make. Since uh, Donald Trump's inauguration on January 20th, I have been involuntarily enrolled in the Kellyanne Conway School of Media Relations. <laughs> Is that a fact? <laughs> <laughs> Alternative well, fact. You know, this training has, has led me to be highly tempted at moments like this just to forget the summary I was promised to offer and just go haywire over a completely different subject. <laughs> So I want, the, want you as an audience to know and the organizers to understand that um, as long as I don't see anything orange, I'm okay. They're <laughs> taping <laughs> it. There is certainly wide-ranging and very important outcomes from this conference. And I think you have arrived at significant conclusions. Uh, Tim Ennis opened the workshop by asking how many had been at uh, last night's public event and then outlined its success, and I too was impressed with the content of last night's presentation, and especially the enthusiasm of the audience. Corey Frank then welcomed participants to the Comox traditional territory, and I think brilliantly thanked everyone for coming together for common purpose. And Tim then introduced Kim Stevens. Uh, he noted that the Eco Asset Symposium has been a watershed moment in a, in a journey that began in 2007, 10 years ago. Collaboration among local governments on a shared vision has been advancing since. And he talked about moving from awareness to action. He also talked about processes for advancing, uh, about what the issue really is, what can be done, what can we do about it, then what after that. And it's important, Kim noted, to embrace shared responsibility, learning by doing, and establishing precedents that can be replicated in other communities. Floods and droughts, he said, were the new normal and that the natural balance and watersheds of out of balance. He noted that we're at a moment of truth with respect to global change having local impact. He explained that British Columbia has policies, programs, and regulatory frameworks that make water resilient communities possible. The next step is to integrate watershed systems thinking into infrastructure asset management. To protect Watershed health engineered infrastructure ought to fit into natural systems rather than the other way around. The new paradigm then should revision uh, watersheds as infrastructure assets. We have to think as a watershed and how a watershed in a watershed streams, groundwater, and people function as a whole system as a means of, and we have to do so as a means of reducing risk. We have to Note that development should be nested within all of these objectives. Kim urged communities to think like a system rather than an accountant by focusing on desired outcomes rather than on prescriptive methodologies. Kim quoted David Allen about achieving sustainable service delivery being the end goal of this asset management, and he also provided steps in that direction. And as Kim often does, he concluded by introducing the idea of cathedral thinking, that is, multi-generational envision and commitment to action. Tim Ennis then introduced Dr. Bill Floyd, a research hydrologist for the government of British Columbia and a respected adjunct professor at Vancouver Island University. Dr. Floyd began by explaining the intricate nature of natural systems and describing the water cycle of the British Columbia coast and its generosity in terms of water supply. He noted the British Columbia coast possesses the most diverse watersheds in the world. Six types of watersheds, he said, have been identified, three of which were prominent on Vancouver Island. Flood events, Dr. Floyd uh, noted, are common in coastal British Columbia, and he explained the important relationship between forest cover and snow water equivalent. Wind, he said, is a primary driver of melt and rain on snow events, especially when trees are absent, which Dr. Floyd suggested should be uh, a reason for better informing water uh, forest practices. Cut blocks should be located out of areas where there's a risk that rain on snow events will generate serious downstream flooding. In addition, we need a plan for climate change. Dr. Floyd then showed Gary Clark's list of wor worst projections for the fate of coast glaciers. 
And I have to say that in watching that, I was reminded of Canadian Pacific Railway's early travel promotions that urged travelers to see this world before the next. What does it mean? Well, it means lower stream flows in spring and summer, loss of ice, changes in timing, duration, and nature of precipitation. What can we do, he asked. Well, we can plan and adapt. In conclusion, the coastal hydrology of British Columbia is complicated. Forest practices impact flooding. We have to know our own watersheds better so we can anticipate how they will change under new hydroclimatic conditions. Tim Ennis then introduced freshwater ecologist Corey Barclough, who talked about water quality in the Comox Lake watershed. Corey began by describing the watershed and its hydrologic dynamics and the vision for the watershed's protection. She then described water quality in the context of ecosystem services as they related to interactions between soil, water, vegetation, and wildlife, and other disturbances, and also interactions associated with local geology. Corey then talked about human influences on water quality. She then introduced the ecological filters that enhance water quality naturally. Finally, Corey listed all of the things we need to do to protect water quality, all of which were included in the Comox Lake Watershed Protection Plan. This plan, Corey concluded, has a strong focus on ecosystems as natural infrastructure, which she urged should provide guidance to communities seeking to incorporate nature into infrastructure asset management. A question period followed during which many technical clarifications were explored. Tim Ennis then introduced Emmanuel Machado, who discussed how the town of Gibson incorporated natural ecosystem function into its infrastructure management and asset accounting. The community has declared that nature is Gibson's most important infrastructure asset. This results, he said, in subdivisions with fewer sidewalks and perhaps less roads. And he noted that the fewer of these infrastructure elements there are, the easier and cheaper that the infrastructure is to maintain. The advantage of this is that there's more room for natural infrastructure that contributes to better health, local well-being, and more desirable communities. Mission, missions reduction, emissions reductions will not, Manuel told us, uh, be enough to deal with the climate change. We can't deal with climate change unless we take advantage of all the help that nature can provide. And to do this, Gibson's has dissolved departments and created teams, each focused on different aspects of managing integrated natural and engineered infrastructure assets. And it was determined that water infrastructure had to start with the aquifer that supplies water, not with the pump house that makes water available to residents. Emmanuel also made it clear, however, that current accounting has to evolve to optimize appreciation of natural ecosystem access. Current risk and liability standards and assessments also have to be modified uh, to make this particular aspect of this ideal possible. New models of valuation are also necessary to assist in creating business cases that incorporate the value of natural infrastructure into development proposal assessments, something that came up later in the day also. Gibson also intends to have more natural capital in the future, and this is exactly what I was talking about last night, what the UN is urging, real restorative development. The goal is that infrastructure that is created is natural, reliable, energy efficient, and more cost effective to man manage and maintain than simply relying solely on engineered solutions. And in conclusion, a manual note of the town of Gibson is a living lab for five pilots in other parts of Canada. Annual Ga Andrew Gower then outlined infrastructure categories focusing uh, first on wastewater, then stormwater. Andrew went on to show how land developments impact stormwater dynamics. He then showed how current stormwater strategies also concentrate flows and contaminants. He then summarized the outcomes of current practices and then offered recommendations for the reform of our current stormwater management policies. These reforms could start with fewer roads again, green infrastructure including stormwater retention, and he noted even better the strategy of stormwater infiltration. He also urged consideration in, uh, of distri distributed sanitary treatment. The big win, however, Andrew concluded, was enhanced eco-asset integration. Then Andrew said the unthinkable thing. In summary, traditional infrastructure design causes more problems than it solves. 
Traditional urban planning has paid little attention, he said, to eco-assets that they were built on. And you add climate change and the status quo is not sustainable. After a break, Tim introduced Jennifer Southurst, Southurst who talked about ecological benefits provided by estuaries. Focusing on, focusing on the Comox estuary, Jennifer identified ecological, economic, and community services benefits uh, that this estuary provided and what was at its stake with respect to its health. She then outlined the coastal shoreline ecosystem services which have been undervalued and need protection. She then listed the biological functions, natural flood and uh, erosion control services that flood plains contribute to controlling uh, water temperature and improving water quality as well as groundwater recharge. She then, very importantly I thought, noted it costs more to provide these services artificially than it does to protect natural ecosystem function. She then outlined how much we have compromised the natural function of floodplains and then outlined how we can reverse these impacts. Jennifer then outlined the desired floodplain attributes we should seek through restoration. Opportunity exists, she concluded, for making room for the river and she showed how, where and how that opportunity could be realized. The final speaker of the morning was John uh, Reedshaw, who discussed the implications of the Comox estuary, uh, for the Comox estuary, of climate change and the attendant sea level rise that would come with it. John showed the current state of development in and around the estuary. He then went on to outline the influence of warming on oceans and on Ar Antarctic glaciers and on Arctic sea ice. He then showed projections for sea level rise generally in a number of model scenarios. He then noted the implications of a faster than projected sea level rise on shorelines. Property lines, he said, he noted will clearly be impacted as will groundwater dynamics. The scramble to build seawalls and revetments, John noted, will have their own impacts on the shoreline. John then discussed natural infrastructure beginning with salt marshes and uh, subtitle eco-asset benefits. He came then back to the value of carbon stored in natural shoreline eco-assets. The options John noted were uh, interesting. They included hard projections, and I laugh like this because he mentioned the Dutch. I always call that going Dutch. <laughs> also avoiding impacts, retreat from shorelines, accommodation through soft solutions utilizing natural eco-assets. Where applicable, John noted, soft solutions can cost 30 to 70 percent cheaper than hard engineering solutions. He then introduced the living dike concept and illustrated the concept with examples. Mirroring the views of so many at this conference, John noted there is tremendous value in eco-assets. And he also noted that we can't ignore them. And he concluded by saying that we have to change our practices. Kim opened the afternoon by noting that a half century later, Eco's asset management affirms Ian McCarr's design with nature. The question Kim then asked is what would eco asset management look like in practice through a local government lens? David then once again cited David, uh, Kim then once again decided, cited John Al David Allen and the sustainable service delivery wheel. He then outlined notable milestones and policy steps starting in 1998 and uh, what that has led you to uh, having before you now. Kim then outlined how current progress could be achieved and advanced. He then introduced Michelle uh, Molnari, who talked about economic metrics. She cited Nobel laureate uh, Joseph Steglitz, who said, what we measure affects what we do, and if we have the wrong metrics, we strive for the wrong things. She then, very valuably, I thought, outlined the questions that needed to be asked to understand and appropriately measure the value of eco-assets. Michelle then introduced Jim Dumont, who applied the eco-asset approach to stream drainage. Jim also noted the challenge of bringing eco-asset approaches into common practice, which will demand, he said, overcoming impediments in both engineering and accounting practice, which can only be achieved through collaboration and education. Jim went on to show how the eco-asset values can be insinuated into current status quo. Uh, Kim then invited, was invited to go out on the floor, and it's always dangerous when you let him loose, to find out reactions from the audience in terms of what caught their attention. 
And in that conversation, a key point was made that landowners and developers need to see the value of eco-asset approaches to them. And that was an interesting conversation in the follow-up. It was made very clear that a gulf existed between the eco-asset eco ideal and the development community, and that gulf needs to be addressed if you're going to be successful. It was also pointed out that spiritual values had yet to be articulated in a way that was adequate, a subject that clearly requires further discussion. Jim Dumont then said it again, the state of art has to the state of the art has to be brought into standard practice. The concurrent workshops followed, the valuable outcomes of which have already been captured and expressed to you. And I, you've already heard these, I won't summarize them. But I must say the high energy session I was in produced some very remarkable results very quickly. They outlined elements of related, to, related to valuing and protecting eco-assets in the middle watershed. They advanced far enough in the session that I was in to go from concept to action, and I think they were able to do that, as Kim implied, because they all more or less knew one another, and many of them had worked together for 10 years. But what I thought was even more interesting, they had a, a common language and they were willing to collaborate. And I think you can overcome much and many of the obstacles that you face here with that approach. And they were amazing, in my view, in that as a result of their brief deliberation, they identified uh, that they could harness enough eco-assets to provide a, enough perpetually high quality water to support a sustainable craft brewery industry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to conclude, if I may, with just a, a few of my own brief observations. And one of the things that I learned over the last two days is something really good is happening in British Columbia. And I travel widely, but I've never heard a conversation like what I have heard over the last two days. And while I often uh, am part of very positive conversations, what was unique was the atmosphere of possibility and hope that I have witnessed here. I think it's important to say, though, that you haven't got everybody in yet, and you don't, as was noted, have full jurisdiction. But as Emmanuel pointed out, success will require patience over generations, one step at a time. And we cannot forget there's been huge investment in what we now realize is an unsustainable status quo. An investment now must be shifted toward restoration that uses the forces of nature itself to help build more efficiently integrated infrastructure that as much as possible maintains itself. What a gift to the world that would be. As I said last night, if you want to live here in perpetuity, per perpetuity, you need to do this. And as I said last night, do not forget the urgency. You have an outstanding example before you in Gibson's. In my view, restorative development is within your grasp. You know what to do. Go to it. Thank you very much.